one of those nights. So tonight I think we're going to try the mayor using a microphone. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Monroe City Council meeting. This is a regular business meeting for Tuesday, September 10th, 2024. The time right now is 7 p.m. PM, I'm going to ask that um, Clerk Wyckoff please call the roll. Thank you. And um, please let the record show that uh, Councilmember Fisher is not here right now. Uh, we do not recall that he uh, had identified himself as being absent at this meeting. Um, so for right now, we will just go ahead and proceed with the meeting and uh, we'll announce when he comes into the meeting uh, for the record. Uh, with all that said, we're going to go ahead and move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask Councilmember Beaumont, please lead us in the pledge. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is public comments. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn to the audience. Is there anybody here that is going to make public comments? This would be where you're talking, but not during the public presentation. Okay. Looks good. And nobody signed in, correct? All right. We're going to go ahead now and move on to item number five. This is announcements and presentations, the 2024 State of the Hospital with Lisa LaPlante. Good evening. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll just go ahead and turn on the microphone right there at the podium for a lectern. I should probably figure out what that is. The standy thing. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. power on Did you just test it there we thank you so as i was talking about day-to-day -day operations of the hospital. You see Megan here, but we also have our chief medical officer, Dr. Kincaid, um, Ann Peterson, our financial officer, and um, both our directors in human resources and um, the foundation who are good spacing with like. Next slide. So this is an advertisement you'll actually see out in the community. You may see it on some buses or at the local movie theater. Um, really important for us to 
stressing that we are we are your community hospital. So we serve not only Monroe, we serve Snohomish, so Sultan, Starlet, Gold Bar, Faring, and Index. Um, and so looking at that, at, we have a very big hospital district. Um, but we are representing here in Monroe. And what we're trying to do is expand our services every day, trying to keep our patients local wherever appropriate. And so that means bringing more specialists, more providers out here so you don't have to travel down to. You don't have to travel down 522 to go get that care, whether it's in person or we're even looking at virtual options in the future. Um, whatever makes sense to keep patients local where appropriate. Um, next slide. To silence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn this over to Megan for some of our broken access. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just to piggyback off a little bit more of what uh, Lisa was saying, you know, we provide those critical access um, medical services to our patients that live out here. Um, we think about um, uh, the fact that we're a trauma designated hospital, right? And there's not another trauma designated hospital until you get to Wenatchee. Um, and so when we think about, at least I was talking about the size of our district, our, our catchment area, um, there really are critical services, medical services that we provide to this community. Um, and something we're really proud about that we've been really striving to and working hard on is how do we continue to meet the needs of our community in a really thoughtful way? What is it as our community continues to grow? We don't know that. Housing developments continue to go out. Um, young families are moving here. How do we meet those needs in a very thoughtful way to provide those services? So we want to talk about broken access. Um, a few really exciting things that have been going on uh, over the past um, year. Uh, actually, this one was just in July. We uh, brought in new IV infusion pumps across the entire hospital. Um, uh, that rollout was in July. We standardized with our Kirkland Hospital, so that was uh, really exciting. Um, these new IV pumps offer uh, better medication guardrails, um, some new safety mechanisms, so we were really, really excited to bring that new technology in. Um, to, to talk a little bit more about our emergency department, uh, we have 14 beds in that emergency department. We are a level four trauma. Uh, as I was mentioning about trauma, we see a lot of trauma patients living out here in Monroe. Um, I think you all know a lot of people come out to recreate, right? And where we're located on this highway to corridor, uh, a lot of folks come out this way. So not only local needs, um, but also those that are coming out here, uh, visitors, um, we have a lot of out-of-towners as well, and we meet those needs. Um, so we have an increasing volume year over year, and you can see on the graph, um, the, the furthest column there on the right does show 2024, that's annualized. We anticipate um, the volume being at about 19,500 visits at the end of this year, and you can see that uh, trajectory as we continue to grow. So we're looking at ways um, how do we continue to increase our capacity in our emergency department and serve our ever-growing uh, patient population out here. Uh, and then we did a refresh in October of 2023. Um, really working hard to update the space that we do have and make sure um, that it is continuing to not only be updated with uh, medical equipment and supplies, but just the floors, paint, right, and keeping updated with those things. And so we did that um, in 2023, and we've seen some really great patient experience uh, success with, with doing that. Our urgent care location uh, here in Monroe that started in April of 2022, it has been, as you can see on this graph, look at that trend line, right? That trajectory of growth. It's been one of the fastest growing locations that we've started in the Evergreen Health System. That tells us that there was clearly a need in this community to serve, um, you know, that not necessarily emergency care, but that urgent care population, those that can't get into their primary care providers right away, but care that is urgent and needed in, in a quick time frame. Um, and we've gotten excellent patient experience for us uh, from our urgent care. So if any of you have had to use those services, we're really proud of that. Um, and that has also led to more volume in our emergency department. We are able to see those patients here and then quickly determine if they need a higher level of care and get them over to the hospital, which is just across the parking lot. So it's been a really wonderful partnership. Um, and uh, we've seen really just strong efficiencies uh, through that clinic. Uh, and then I do want to touch upon our surgery department. So in May of last year, we brought on our Mako robot, uh, which for those that may not know, a Mako. Robot in Monroe. A robot in our Monroe Hospital. We didn't know, yeah, that would actually happen out here in our hospital. So we're really, really proud of that. Um, and um, our Mako robot is a type of robot that um, helps with elective total joint procedures. So when you think about total knees, total hips, um, and this is a big deal. This is really cutting edge kind of surgery we see quicker recovery times, better outcomes for patients. 
Um, so we're really proud of this. Um, we've really increased our orthopedic services here in Monroe in the last year and a half, two years, um, and those volumes are increasing. Uh, so really proud of our, our team that we've built here and have that uh, level of care in Monroe. We don't have to travel for that. Next slide, please. So to talk a little bit more, um, you know, none of this really would be possible for us without our partnership with our Evergreen Health Medical Group through our Kirkland campus. Um, that medical group is helping to provide our increased specialty services um, and, and they're a fantastic group of providers. And so we're very fortunate. They're also passionate about this community and the folks that we've been able to recruit to come out to Monroe quickly see the need and they fall in love with this community. Um, so we started with our cardiology clinic in October of 2023. We have two cardiologists that come out, Dr. Talavera and Dr. Gonzalez, and they are all about preventative cardiac medicine. Um, and they, those clinics quickly filled. And again, you can see the, the trajectory there, how we have increased our volume basically month over month um, with little dips here and there for vacations and things. We do let them go on vacation every now and then, sometimes. <laughs> um, but they've been very, very busy. And clearly, again, there's been a need in our community for this specialty care. So we're really proud of how quickly that clinic has has grown in the way we've been able to serve the needs. We're looking at some other options now, expanding our diagnostic imaging and cardiology services, so stress testing. Uh, we're actively working on cardiac CT services that all combines to provide those wraparound cardiac uh, services for care, so really excited about that. Um, happy to announce that in September, so this month, a little bit later this month, uh, ear, nose, and throat is also uh, being added to that specialty, multi-specialty clinic uh, on the second floor of our hospital. So um, not only will we be seeing patients in an outpatient uh, perspective in the clinic, but providing um, surgical care as well. So uh, ear tubes, uh, tonsillectomies, things like that, where we haven't been able to provide those services here at Mount Monroe campus previously. So really looking forward to that partnership. We're expanding with gastroenterology uh, and doing more screening colonoscopies. We have two GI providers that are um, onboarding in the next couple of months. Um, and so we'll be quickly ramping up those services as well. Those that may not know, there's a huge need in our community for um, uh, screening colonoscopies. There was a need already going into COVID. And then when a lot of those elective procedures shut down, a huge backlog occurred. And so we're still trying to work through that backlog of getting through screening um, elective colonoscopies. Um, so we're really working to meet the need of our community in that way as well. Um, excited to announce we have a second general surgeon that is joining our uh, team as well in January um, of 2025. And so that will expand our surgical capabilities as well. So a lot of growth uh, in our procedural areas uh, in surgeries. And then diagnostic imaging. We have to support all of this wraparound care with those tests and diagnostic imaging. Our volumes uh, across those modalities continue to increase. So we're talking about um, CT, MRI, ultrasound, mammography, and we continue to look at ways to create redundancy. Specifically, we're looking at our CT services right now. How do we potentially get a second CT machine to support our trauma patients, our stroke patients, um, things like that when they're coming through our emergency department? Next slide, please. Okay, yeah, yeah. Lisa, come back up. So with, with all the growth that we've seen um, and continued actually market share uh, shift that we've seen to Evergreen Health and Evergreen Health in a row, um, we have been fortunate enough the past couple of years since COVID to be one of the very few hospitals in the state of Washington with a positive bottom line. And it's the first time the hospital here has had a positive bottom line. Um, so it, it's really exciting. It, it just shows that with growth, um, we're able to bring in a lot more services and really be able to provide that care to our community. So um, this just shows the month end, July 2024, um, our net operating income, um, we were 5.6 5. 5. 5. million year to date um, uh, ahead of budget. And net income, 9.9 .9 million um, ahead of budget. Gage cash return, <coughs> so what that means for the organization is if we stop receiving any revenue from payers, how long can we exist and continue to provide patient care? Um, right now, uh, when I started in 2010 in the organization, we may have been at one or two days cash on hand, and that was if we're lucky because we were holding checks. It was a bad time back then. We are now at 124. We're actually 
far beyond that and proceed to be beyond that um, into the future financially because of the affiliation with Kirkland and being able to systemize a lot of the, the uh, support services and things like that, we'd be able to be more efficient. We pay the same pay as all the other hospitals within Puget Sound, and that's a big thing from the know. We've never been able to do that before. We've done between um, 10 to 20 to 25 percent raise increases um, in the past year, um, 2.3 million dollars in increases, but it's showing that our staff are here, they're here to serve. Um, for the first time ever in this past year, we didn't have any open nursing vacancies. Didn't last long because we are growing, so that's a good thing. Um, but um, the, the hospital is really doing well. So the first time in the 64th history of being a public hospital district here, we achieved a positive bottom line solely on our operating revenue. So that means support any levy dollars. So that means we can invest for massive capital back into the organization, um, pay our staff um, with the levy dollars that we do get um, and continue to grow. And so it, it's a really great place for the organization to be. We're in a difficult position because we need a lot more space than we have now. We need a lot more patient care space. Right now, um, every day we're caring for our patients in the ED hallway because we are so busy. We went from seeing an average of 22 patients a day during COVID. Now our average is 50, 96. 55 to 60. And so, and our staff are handling it exceptionally well but we don't have the space for it. So we are looking, we're in master facility planning right now, we're in a pre-design process um, to look for additional patient care space, including ED, doubling our ORs, um, our inpatient beds, um, imaging, things like that. We have to prepare now for the future growth of our community. Um, and this is a 10 to 15 year plan. Um, so we're just in the beginning phases of that, um, but the support we're seeing and the shift of our community and beyond is huge. Um, so I, I'm just very proud to be a part of the, the team that we have at the hospital here, be a part of the system of Evergreen Health. Uh, we could not do that, all of this, without them. And I, I think we have a lot more potential in the future. So uh, next slide. This is on here. All right, so we want to wrap up with, uh, as if that wasn't feel good enough, we think it's pretty feel good, but um, we want to wrap up with a really feel good story, which is to talk a little bit more um, about the opportunity we had with the, the partnership with the City of Monroe and our ARPA funding uh, with our recovery center. So for folks that may not know, our recovery center is for substance use disorder patients, and we have an uh, acute detox uh, um, side of the, the facility as well as a residential side of the facility. Um, and so we've been honored to receive several rounds of that funding, um, which is dedicated to substance use uh, recovery for locally uninsured patients. And many of those uh, come through uh, the Embedded Social Worker Program. Um, and that's where those referrals have typically come through for this scholarship program. Um, so it's really about, you know, seeing a need within the community through interactions uh, when they're out on site and saying, hey, we can help you. Uh, let's get you to a place that can really support you in your recovery. Um, when folks are ready to do that. Um, and so there, there are population concerns, right? Um, these folks are coming with um, often their very basic of needs not being met. And so trying to go through a time of recovery <coughs> can be very challenging. So one of the first things is just meeting those basic needs, right? How do we do that to make sure that we can move through the basis of recovery for folks? Um, and so in addition to providing that structure, education, support, we also have to think about how do we make sure they feel safe, right? They're secure, they've got food, they have warmth, right? Clothing, all those kinds of things. And so that's part of this um, program, and we're so proud to be the partner with the, the city of Monroe for this scholarship. Next slide, please. So lastly, I do want to talk about one of our success stories. Um, this is a 35-year-old female who was a scholarship recipient uh, that was able to come through our recovery center. Um, who was uh, uh, dealing with both fentanyl and heroin um, uh, uh, addiction and uh, was in need of, of support and services. And so um, she was also treated for co-occurring, uh, what we call co-occurring when there's also behavioral health or mental health component, um, anxiety and depression. And that's very, very often the case. Um, substance use and mental health disorders can often be very interwoven with each other. Um, and so uh, during her stay with us, staff uh, 
recognized that she needed multiple medical touch points. And so they were able to help facilitate those things. Um, at one point, she needed to go to the ER for something acute. They also got her to the dentist. I mean, some of these routine things that her care that she had not been able to seek otherwise. Um, they also really helped her set up uh, court appoint, uh, uh, appearances and follow through on that end. Um, and then ultimately, she was able to go completely through the program um, successfully and entered a long-term treatment facility. And then at the end of that, was able to reunite with her family. So um, this was one that I know our team over there, it's not always successful, right? We, we see patients that come back time and time again, and they're, we're there every time to greet them and hope that this time will be the time they're successful. Um, when we have someone that goes through treatment and moves on in this kind of way, it's it's provides such hope for our team as well for the work that they do, and it's so validating for the work that we do at the recovery center. So um, again, we're very thankful for that opportunity and the partnership with the city. Um, and with that, we can go ahead and move to the next slide, and Lisa and I are happy to entertain any questions that anyone might have. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, for the record, I'm going to announce, uh, hi Kyle. Uh, the council member Fisher is here. He arrived at roughly 7.05 or so when he came in there. So thank you. Um, and I turn to council. Uh, any questions? Go ahead. I was going to call you council member Campbell because your name is Jeremiah Campbell. You're the vice president. <laughs> we'll go with hand for I'm going to go with the white sides. The vice president works for me. Oh, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to come with a raise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I appreciate your report. I appreciate the, the good news story at the end. I appreciate you coming and thanking the city for the ARPA funds uh, because we don't get a lot of that. So that means a lot to, to me. Um, I've utilized your urgent care and had a great experience there. Uh, have utilized your facilities multiple times with my large family and uh, most recently uh, when I was with my wife and I were visiting a family member there uh, we went we got buzzed in to see that family member and the nurse at the station recognized us and we recognized her I think her name is Penny and she helped with the birth of our 27 and 25 year old kids. Our wow. own nurse, yes. Wow. They're been there forever. Yeah. Valley General. Yes. And uh, so that was really cool yeah. <laughs> to see her and talk to her for a bit. And she was just as sweet as ever. And uh, so I'm hoping that. I'm not, I'm not applying to have any more kids. <laughs> 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 but I'm hoping that like, for families that are planning to do that, that that's in your future. Uh, because it was very convenient. And you talk about the community and all that. It would be very nice to have that opportunity for young families that are looking to have more children. So I'm hoping maybe. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you for that. That's something on the horizon, but. And we'll share that with Penny if that's okay. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Customer Walker. Thank you guys for coming and presenting. I'm ready to run through a wall off those uh, numbers that you were showing. That's amazing. It's so exciting. Um, and uh, I just, I was thinking about how lucky we really are as a, a community to have you guys so close. I had a, uh, experience with my um, son, he was like 13 months, 14 months old at the time, where I went in to check on him in the night and he was having some trouble breathing. Um, and we live in the Frylands, and it was one of those emergency situations 30 second drive um, to the hospital. And I think we were in a, a room with a, a team helping us within, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes of arriving, maybe less, five minutes. Uh, it was an incredible experience. Um, the care was amazing it was reassuring and it had us feeling a lot better it was just uh, it was one of those uh moments where i was just like I, I can't believe we have this right in monroe um and in a situation like that to think of a family in sultan or, or up on ingram road or uh, florence acres having a similar situation that's 40 minutes to kirkland or um 10 minutes to monroe so 
so grateful um, for all the work that all of your uh, nurses and doctors and staff of all kinds do there and thank you for the incredible stewardship clearly um, grateful for you guys thank you appreciate that there's so many so many people in our district that know the travel that we have to take to get anywhere up to 522 and other places are just like come here you can get the services here that's a long travel and it depends on the day and depends on if it's a sunday in the summer you're going to travel a long time so that's why we want to keep everything we can that's appropriate right here right there's not everything we're going to be able to do here but sky's the limit i feel <laughs> thank you for that thank you guys yeah, thank you thank you that's what we no i really appreciate the report um for some of us we've heard many of these reports and uh We've been through times where we didn't know what we were going to have. This asset, uh, there's been a lot of work across you know, the board as a community. Um, and it's just so, um, you know, and you use the word feel good. It is, it's a, that's feel good. It's great. I look at the you know, numbers like this and to hear that said screams future to me. And, you know, and how do we build on it? I'm with Kevin. I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, that is something for young families that would be great for the community. Um, but yeah, I just can't uh, thank you guys enough. I'm extremely encouraged so far. Come a long way from the reports of uh, 2010. It's it's a long it's a long way from from there. So just uh, thanks. Doing great work. Um, so yeah, it's ample. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just for me, I. You know, one of the things when you're when you're campaigning, when you're going for knowing, um, you begin to realize how much there is to educate the public on. And I don't know that people really quite grasp the fact. You know, you, you know, you've got the school district, and there are people that think the mayor and the council are in charge of the school district. Um, at, at least they know there's a school district in the in the city, but yours, and they know about fire district, but people don't think about school district uh, about the uh, hospital district, and having the public. Hospital district here is so important for um, not just people having kids, but also for seniors. Well, I, me too, but I mean, you know, seniors also. So I I know that I have learned over the last few years, especially about how you have sort of um, areas of our nation that are in hospitals. You'd be driving a couple hours to get to a hospital, and a lot of those are, are rural areas. So you serve an extremely important function here. Uh, providing services all the way down Highway 2, in addition to your own. And I know that um, in addition to trails and parks, um, housing affordability, um, transportation hub, it was having a hospital here that helped us um, make this the choice for where we decided to live back in 2000. And um, you know, I just want to express how much I appreciate that you're here. And then to the council members, just when you can, Talk to folks about what a hospital district is because it's part of our civics you never learn about in school. And um, yeah, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where we're not properly funding it and we don't have it here. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next item on the agenda this evening. And that agenda. That agenda. Okay. Early morning, I probably need some water. <laughs> Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is consent agenda. Um, what I turn to the council? Insert Jeffrey's music here. Okay, go ahead, Councilman Walker. I move to approve the consent agenda as provided in the packet. Second, Fulcher. Yeah, motion from Councilman Walker, a second from Councilmember Fulcher to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes 7 0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, unfinished business. We're going to move to the one item under that, item 7.1, which is Emergency Housing Fund, EHF, Washington State Fund and Commerce, Commerce Hotel, uh, Motel, voucher program contracts with Stones County and the AWW. Great. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to uh, to you today for further consideration on the emergency motel voucher contract. Um, at our last meeting, um, there was 
a request for clarification around the coordinated entry requirement. Um, I was able to connect with um, our county partners and they clarified that the, the wording in the contract is intended not to eliminate the coordinated entry requirement, but just to designate who, who is allowed to uh, fill out that assessment with the clients. So it, um, it is uh, making it so that the people who are working under this contract are not responsible for filling out the coordinated entry assessment with the, the, um, the clients. They will be referring them to 211, um, like everybody else would have to go through 211 and do the coordinated entry assessment through 211. So um, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer. And we do also um, have Susan, I believe, joining us in the audience. Uh, if the council members have any questions on the um, the county contract that she might be able to answer that I might not be able to answer for you today. All right, thank you. I'm going to ask a quick uh, to go ahead and bring Susan uh, as Price. Price, forward. Yeah. Just in case there are questions, we'll make it a little bit quicker. Good evening, Susan. How are you? Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move to the council now, see if there are any questions. And I will uh, acknowledge, um, I'll go ahead and acknowledge uh, Ms. Adams. And if she indicates that uh, you would be better to respond, I'll go ahead and ask you to answer the question. Does that sound good? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So I turn to the council. Are there any uh, questions? You can see the request to action for your consideration. Councilmember Walker, go ahead. Thank you for the clarification between um, the last version and this. Um, what what observation during the last round led to the change of the program to Monroe residents only? Um, I believe that uh, we wanted to narrow the focus and, and target an impact on uh, Monroe. So the, these funds are being administered by the city of Monroe with the intent for the city of Monroe to uh, see the benefit and the direct impact. Uh, so I think that's part of it. I think um, it's also to make uh, the contract more manageable for our new agency DOA, um, just to not have to displace anyone from their area of residence. Thank you. And then um, with regard to that question, the, the residency question, I, I could be wrong, but I think somewhere in the packet I saw um, there being a uh, restriction that the person cannot location of residence or prior residence can't be used um, to qualify for the program. I could be wrong on that, but my question is, how is residency established? Um, because my, my worry is that if this, if there were people from outside of Monroe who were still using the program and were then getting um, vouchers to stay in Monroe, that, that is sort of my, my concern. In other words, do we limit the, the lodging to Monroe, but still be willing to take in um, those who, who need the vouchers from outside of the city? Yeah, so um, typically the way we establish residency for our homeless um, is to have our service providers provide uh, letters verifying their homelessness status. Uh, so our law enforcement embedded social worker does that pretty regularly, and so does so do most of our social workers and navigators, uh, community partners that we're using. Yeah, so they'll be, they'll have developed that relationship with their clients and be able to vouch for them being from their own. Um, I, I spoke with a, a gentleman who had benefited from this program um, and he explained to me the impact that it had on his situation and uh, night that he slept in the cold when he didn't have it. So um, I appreciate it. I think it's a really good option for us to have. Um, and I'll, I'll be supporting it. So that's all I have. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions or a motion from Council? Council Member Gamble. Uh, that no, I appreciate the clarification. That was you know for, for a lot of us. I think the only and you know for me it resolves Know, my concerns because we had a presentation on the first vote to explain coordinated entry program all that 
I guess is it, um, the only question I had was, so is this just to, um, why wasn't it a problem before, I guess is what I'm saying. Is that something that they just, we just didn't want to cross, to, to be in that, or we didn't want somebody putting them into the program or to do the coordinated entry as, a, as the person that's doing the grant, or is it the DOA that would be doing that? I guess, why did we take the language out that if you're still going through a coordinated entry program, why wasn't it a problem? Um, I think I would turn to Susan for that clarification. Susan, go ahead. Thank you. This was really just a correction of the language. We have contracts that run for all of our emergency shelter programs that have this language. It had been many years ago that our emergency shelters used to actually do the co coordinated entry assessment. We've stopped that practice. And so as we were updating this contract, we were just correcting the language. It actually really shouldn't have been in there last time. And it was never the intent that this contract would actually have staff that complete the coordinated entry assessment that's only done by agencies that are specifically contracted to do that work. They're specifically trained. And the reason we've narrowed it down in that way is, one, to allow emergency shelters to focus on what they're doing best. Motels are a form of emergency shelter and also allows us to focus on having really skilled and trained navigators that do the work of the assessment so that all clients are assured equal access by having the assessment done consistently. So we have a pretty narrow group of people that are contracted to do the work of doing the assessment. That's our navigation work. And that's a separate contract from this one. So really it was just a language cleanup. Um, unfortunately, it, it probably added some confusion. I do apologize for that. Oh, all good. Actually, that explanation makes a couple sense and I uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions from the counselor version? Okay. There's a requested action, so go ahead. Councilman Gilmore. Thank you. Thank I move to approve the Emergency Housing Fund, Washington State Department of Commerce, Motel Voucher Program contracts with Snohomish County, contract 2024-81, and with Volunteers of America, Western Washington, contract 2024-082. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Beaumont, a second from Councilmember Gamble for the requested action under unfinished business item 7.1 is shown on the screen in the discussion on the motion. Seeing none, I'll call for the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Motion passes 6-1 with Councilmember Fisher voting against. All right. Thank you very much. Did I get that vote count right? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Susan, thank you very much for coming this evening to, so we could ask questions. I appreciate it. Um, and You're for, welcome. So they appreciated it as well. So thank you. All right. Uh, next up on the agenda then is... Um, new business item number 8.1, award change of scope request to St. Vincent to call housing with wraparound services again with Ms. Adams. This is Ms. Adams shows. It really is. Yeah. Yep. Um, so this item is a change of scope request uh, to reallocate um, some funds from um, the Heather's Hope line item, the Flex funds line item, and the administration line item into hotel room line item so that um, St. Vincent de Paul can continue providing hotel nights. Um, hotel, hoteling is a very expensive program, um, so this would benefit um, being able to continue those hotel nights. Uh, the case management services, uh, which is part of the wraparound services component of this program, remains untouched, um, so that uh, will continue as a part of the program also. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I turn to council. Any questions or a motion? Councilor Walker. Uh, I move to approve the change of scope request from St. Vincent de Paul to reallocate the agency's 2023-2024 general fund award toward providing more hotel room nights. And for a second. I have a motion from Councilor Walker, a second from Councilmember Hanford for the request to action shown on the screen as new business item number 8.1 in the discussion on the motion. Go ahead, Councilmember Walker. Um, I just wanted to 
to give a shout out to Roger Evans and Donnell because uh, I um, had the opportunity to uh, talk to a lot of um, our individuals in Monroe that again are benefiting from this program and uh, what becomes um, very clear is that Roger and Donnell are, are invaluable um, uh, for our community and, and making these programs. Um, they're just they're such boots on the ground, so I just wanted to give them specific appreciation. Thank you, Councilmember. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes 7 0. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is uh, is Rachel's business, uh, <laughs> number 8.2. <laughs> Um, this is opioid, opioid, there we go, opioid settlement funding allocation to the scholarship bank program for Ms. Adams. All right, so this item um, is an opportunity to approve allocating $30,000 of um, opioid settlement funding into the scholarship bank program, which I was delighted to have Evergreen Health um, here to present some success stories from that program earlier. Um, we have funded them, as you heard, uh, with our ARC funds as part of a pilot project. It's been very successful, and there are some success stories also attached to your agenda items tonight. Um, and the, uh, as the Community Human Services Advisory Board considers how they would like to recommend allocating these uh, limited use funding sources, they, they wanted to continue funding the scholarship and program, which is currently out of funding. So this would allow for funding through the end of the year um, by uh, extending the current contract. Thank you very much. Friends and Council, for questions or a motion? Go ahead, Council Member Thank you, Rachel. I think that this is a wonderful use of $30,000 in opioid settlement funds. And obviously, it was great timing to have um, this presentation tonight. So I would like to move to approve allocating $30,000 in opioid settlement funds to support ongoing funding for the scholarship and program at the Evergreen Health Care Center. And I have a second. Okay, I have a motion from Councilmember Beaumont. And uh, I heard both Hanford and Scarborough. That's the first time I've been to Scarborough this evening. Um, sure. That's the first time I've heard you this evening, I think. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, motion uh, seconded by Councilmember Scarborough. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Okay. Um, before we move forward with the vote, I am just going to simply express how much I appreciate that you're doing this. Um, I don't know if you all remember, but uh, about a year or two ago, when there was discussion about the opioid bill dollars coming in, first is something that I, I kind of opposed. Well, I opposed um, because I don't like letting people out. You know, like these businesses getting let off the hook uh, for what they've done to the United States. Um, so that bothers me. With that said, I think what we're doing with, with the money is the right thing to do. Um, uh, about a year or two ago, I remember going into a meeting with uh, Snohomish County. Um, they were talking about trying to get all of us to pay into a sort of a regional approach. And I explained to them that Monroe is doing what's right for Monroe. And we wanted to keep the funds that we have rather than participate regionally. And have the money in that where it can go into some fund about education and flyers and stuff like that. To me, this is the right thing. We're actually uh, positively impacting people's lives. Um, we've even had, as of I think it was last, that was two years ago now, King Five came out and did uh, something about uh, about the center. Yeah. And um, I, this is the right thing to do with it. So while I am not in favor of settlement on this issue, and I'd rather see them. Um, in jail, um, I think that what we're doing here is the right thing. So that makes me feel angry on one side for settlement, but but good on the other side for doing what's right with the money. So thank you, everybody. Uh, with all that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All Aye. opposed? Motion passes 6 0. Please let the record show that Councilmember uh, Fulcher was not in the room for the vote. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move on to council member reports. I'm going to start with remote folks. Council member Fisher, you're up first. Hey, what's going on? Sorry, I couldn't be there tonight. You guys hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Um, I don't really have a whole lot. Um, I just thought I would bring up again since we had the dispensary conversations 
Um, and I was one that was opposed to them. Just if anybody's been watching the news, one of the reasons why I was opposed to it, because there is a um, cannabis shop, hashtag cannabis in Redmond that has been hit five times this year. It just got hit again two days ago. Um, and another one in Seattle also had a stolen car, ran into it and was robbed at gunpoint. So <clears throat> I did an, uh, a quick little interview with uh, Everett Harold, and my stance on it was just the safety for our community. So I just thought I'd bring it back up again just to kind of keep it on people's minds because um, it's going to come up again for us here before too long. Other than that, that is everything. Thank you, Councilmember Fisher. Uh, Councilmember Walker. Um, I was able to uh, catch the first hour of the Snohomish County tomorrow uh, steering committee meeting before the uh, Blueberry Park ribbon cutting. Um, saw an interesting presentation about road usage charges, RUCs, um, as the likely replacement for fuel taxes in Washington. Um, it was a presentation on a study that the state did and the results that came from it. Uh, it sounds like it's not a if, but a when um, it's implemented in Washington. It sounded like in the next five years. Uh, in terms of its effect on Monroe, it sounded like. About uh, the restrictions that will be placed on its expansion of charges over the year. It's a mileage based charge uh, with so far different ways for people to opt in was what was being studied. Uh, really interesting something for us to continue to watch in case it's uh, an item that we want to talk with our legislators about, um, especially as it relates to, to traffic. Anyways, um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that to your guys' attention. Blueberry Park is, uh, is fantastic. Um, the community has just been in love with it from what I've seen by driving by. So uh, thanks for all, uh, thanks all who made that come together. Uh, yeah, that's all I have. All right. Thank you very much. Councilmember Holcher. Great. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, chamber luncheon today went very well. Um, Patrick Doherty did a very good job of um, talking about the financial, I mean, the economic vitality of our wonderful town. And I just enjoyed his viewpoint. Um, and also how much experience he has that is varied. It's just it's beyond economic development. Striping around town, amazing. Looks so good. Um, all the streets and the, you know, the curbs and all that kind of stuff looks just amazing. Like a lot of good appeal there with the curbs. Uh, very, a lot of curb appeal, appeal on the curbs. Curb yeah. appeal. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Exactly, sir. Um, no. <laughs> um, I like, tried. It's been a long day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I did get a chance to um, work in concessions at one of the movies at the park, and that's a fun thing. Um, also, who knew that we have a big, you know, puffy movie theater thing? That's kind of cool. And um, so that was fun. Um, the community transit board meeting the other day was, you know, eventful as usual, but, you know, I was there. And um, just appreciating how beautiful our our hometown is this time of year, and that is about it. Thank you. Councilmember Beaumont. Thank you, Mayor. Um, gosh, let's see. Um, school is back in session, and we have the sidewalk finished all down 179th, the Park Place Middle School, which is lovely to see. It is done on time, and so kids are able to walk safely down uh, that street, which is wonderful progress from last year. And we have new crosswalks going in. I've been hearing from a lot of um, happy people about that, that we are improving pedestrian safety. And so that's been a really nice thing to see. Um, belonging was Saturday. I attended that and attended the chamber luncheon today with uh, council members Walker and Fulcher. And I have a sh shameless plug for the Monroe Historical Society. September 28th. We have bingo at the Senior Center, and I talked about this at the Chamber. I'm going to talk about it again. The Monroe Historical Society is a nonprofit, community-based organization that does a lot for our community, 
anybody needs historic photos for their business. Oh, we're having a 1967 class reunion. We are here, all volunteer run to support the community. And we really do support the community since 1976. So this is a way to raise money to keep our museum free. It's Wednesday, Saturday, noon to three, always been free, open to everybody. We'd like to keep it that way. We'd like to continue to bring kids in for school tours for free. And this is a way for us to do that. So I have posters here. If anyone would like to put them up anywhere, uh, Deborah graciously offered to put one up at the city. Heather and Jake also offered. And I really appreciate the support. Maybe the mayor might put it in his newsletter. But um, would love to see everybody there. Bingo's fun. It's at the Senior Center. If you've ever been to a Senior Center bingo event, it's a blast. So um, that's my shameless plug. Please support us. We support the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Hanford. Thank you, Mayor. I don't know how to follow that up. I, <laughs> I don't have any shameless plugs. You um, can sing a song. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was at the Blue Gray Park ribbon cutting and that was so amazing to see. It's just beautiful. Uh, the parade was fantastic this year, despite the rain. Uh, I was really blown away by the number of families and, and people still lining the sidewalks, kids ready for candy. And uh, it was really, really cool. Uh, the striping looks great, like you said, the flashing crosswalks, very excited for talked about those for years. Uh, and I just wanted to ask if there's an update on the we had talked about it at one point, but the administrator from Monroe Christian School had come and asked about getting permission with some kind of a zoning uh, misunderstanding or something where they can't use the church building that's the house part of the church property there next door. So we'll get some information to the things. council. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Councilmember Gamble. No report. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Davis. <laughs> Councilmember Scarborough. I too was at the uh, ribbon cutting at the park and it's it's nice to see uh, our money and things that help the community and and the community using them. I did want to ask Councilman Beaumont about the moving of the two houses. She had brought up that there might be a, some progress on getting those two old houses over by uh, over by the railroad tracks tractor uh, the tractor place over there. I, Chicken so if there's ready. anything, I'd like to know about that. Otherwise, it's just good to be alive. Thank you. Good. Um, if staff has any information about that, they'll share it with you. Um, otherwise, I know that Councilmember Beaumont will be available after the exec session. to will probably fill you in. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to, thank you very much, Council Members. I'm um, going to go ahead and move to uh, staff, and that would be Parks Department update with, with Ben. <laughs> I'm like, you're not feral. <laughs> <laughs> He's on my. Yeah. Hi, Mike. I know you're waving. At least I'm going to hope that you are. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, wrapped up a really big month. Uh, I know that uh, the Blueberry Playgrounds will talk about quite a bit. That was a huge success. Uh, I know uh, Park staff got a lot of credit, and I mentioned to a few of you, but I wanted everyone to know what a pivotal role Matthew Bush, is our senior engineer and our public works partner, played in this. And so he, the stormwater project, he inherited when he came on board, but also that transition into the parks. And so he was a big, big part of that project. He took quite a bit of that credit. And so I just wanted to bring him to the forefront because he was a senior year. <laughs> but, um, but unfortunately, we're trying to do two parks this year. We're trying to do Blueberry and Curry. Um, Curry's going to have to work those springs. We're just running on a weather window. That squishy stuff that you walked on, uh, the board in place, it takes a certain temperature and no rain for about a week. And so uh, we're just running out of the window because by the time you get the playground installed, it's going to be raining. So that'll be scheduled for the first uh, first part of spring when we're going to get the playground installed. Um, not to mention all the events that we had. Uh, we got some great feedback from our uh, Lake Tide Tri. I think there's even in the department report, there's a uh, note from the event organizer. So that went really well. Uh, Night Out Against Crime. And, um, and Cruz has been doing a great job. Leaves. Is there any questions? 
Thank you. Any questions for Parks? All right. Um, as I mentioned to Mike last week uh, in our monthly meeting, I just really appreciate all the work uh, the Parks Department's been doing this summer. Uh, everything has been looking great. Um, all of the uh, events um, went really well. And just please thank your staff uh, for us, uh, uh, for all the work they've done and everything. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and go down to item number 11, City Administrator Report Extended Agenda. Administrator Knight. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Looking at the extended agenda going forward into the rest of September, we will be canceling the Finance and Human Resources Committee meeting on the 17th. And then we have uh, just a couple of items scheduled for the regular study session, and that includes uh, coming back to the council with additional information about the law enforcement embedded social worker program. So that's the only item that we have on the agenda uh, at this moment, but I'm sure it will uh, be filling up over the next couple of days. And looking forward to the 24th, we are tentatively scheduling our transportation benefit district public hearing for the TBD budget. So we will be potentially starting that meeting at 6 p.m. and um, all the members of the council are members of the Transportation Benefit District Board and we'll be sending out reminders as we get closer to that date. For the regular business meeting then on the 24th, we will be having a public hearing on Ordinance 006-2024, uh, Traffic Safety Cameras. Um, that is a, a public hearing that will take place. Under the consent agenda, we've got the regular accounts payable um, and the meeting minutes. And then we have uh, potentially under new business, the revenue estimates um, with Greg Thramer. So if we are prepared um, for that, we'll bring it forward to council for uh, further discussion about where we're at with revenues. I'm looking forward to 25 and 26. And then uh, regular department reports, city administrator report, and then an executive session for potential litigation. All right. Um, any questions on the extended agenda from the council? Go ahead, Councilmember Walker. Um, Deborah, thank you for doing such a good job talking uh, at the chamber luncheon today. Uh, I wanted to see if we could potentially do the TBD meeting um, on another week. Would really love to do a P3 committee meeting. It's been a while. Um, so I don't know if that's if that's possible, uh, but that would just be my my preference. Thank you. Uh, any other thoughts from council members? Did you want to? So we have uh, other P3 committee members. Go ahead, council member Bill March. Is there anything for the agenda for a P3 committee meeting? I think is the question. It, and I'm not aware of anything at this time, but if there are some items that, uh, for example, the city council is looking to gain additional information on, that might be something uh, we could bring forward, but we would need some direction from council. Okay, so I agree. It's been a really long time since P3 has met, and I think we're all sort of feeling a little strange about that. But if there's nothing on the agenda to bring us, um, certainly we don't have a reason to meet. Um, I recommend that or, we, you know, we've got a week to the next council meeting. So if P P3 members have items that you'd like to have brought forward to the agenda, maybe come to the meeting next week with those items and we can see perfect. about scheduling okay. it for some time. Sounds great. I think the, um, the only thing to consider is, is that if we're not going to have a P3 meeting and we do need to have a meeting for the Transportation Benefit District and a public hearing, we do need to notice that. So we do need to give the clerk time to notice the meeting. The, the TBD meeting? The TBD meeting. Okay, I'm not sensing the issue being the TBD meeting. What I'm uh, sensing is that they would like to have a P3 meeting. Okay. So uh, you but it doesn't have to be on the same night as what I heard. It could be another night. So you want to reschedule Correct. the TBD meeting is what I'm hearing. Yes. No. Oh, no, no, no. P3. My bad. Yes. P reschedule the P3 meeting. Okay. Yes. Got it. <laughs> and reschedule I'm P3 for another night. Have the TBD meeting on the 24th. And, and it would be great to hear from Council Member Fisher, who is the third member of our committee on this as well. Okay, great. So, so let's go ahead and bring that up during your reports next week. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Council Member Fisher. 
I felt like I had to say something now that she called me out. Um, no, if there's nothing on the agenda, I'm completely okay with it. Move, move forward with TPD and just let us know. All right, thank you. All right, uh, anything further on the extended agenda? All right, seeing none, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the city administrator report, Administrator Knight. Thank you, just a couple of items uh, to bring to the council's attention. Uh, one obviously was the uh, tentative transportation benefit district board meeting at 6 p.m. on the 24th and just wanted to confirm that there will be a forum available for that meeting. Looks like there is, thank you. Uh, at today's chamber meeting, there was an announcement that our representatives from the 12th Legislative District representatives Steele and Gaynor um, will be speaking at the next chamber meeting, uh, and that is scheduled for Tuesday, October 8. So if there um, are council members who are interested in attending, if you could let Liam McCorkle know, and if we get more than four members, then we will notice for a quorum at that meeting. If you're interested, he'll get you signed up for that. Uh, then just an announcement that you recently appointed members to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, and we are um, getting ready to um, put out a notice, uh, a call for applications um, for our Lodging Tax uh, dollars. And uh, the first meeting um, for the um, LTAC Committee will be held on October 10th, that's just to get them kind of up to speed on what their roles and responsibilities are. And then uh, we'll have a second meeting for that group to review applications and then um, make uh, uh, provide a list to the city council of projects that they would like to fund. So that'll be coming back forward to the council then in October and in November. Councilmember Scarborough, go ahead. That's yes. Eleven thirty. You're welcome. Go ahead. Uh, and then the last item was just a grateful community member who sent uh, in a notice through our customer relationship management database, Monroe Listens, just thanking the council um, and expressing their appreciation for the work that the city did in getting the rectangular rapid flashing beacons in place around the community. So just wanted to share that uh, with the city council and let you know that um, there's a lot of community members who are very grateful for those. All right. Any question? Oh, go ahead, Councilmember Scarborough. Signs. Okay. Um, Jody. Yeah, and and just for information, I I don't know what happens with those banners, but I would anticipate that next year you'll have different banners uh, with the right logo on them. And so uh, while you're bringing them back, I, I acknowledge that it'll be up to the chamber, like what happens with banners that wouldn't otherwise be used. So, all right, uh, anything further? All right, uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the mayor's report. And um, yeah, pretty much everybody has already shared a lot of the stuff. And so um, does anybody have any questions for me? Oh, I did want to mention, thank you. That's why we have those things on the slide. Um, I've reappointed Alex Keefe to position two on the Civil Service Commission uh, with a term ending on September 30th. And um, I think that's all I have uh, this evening. Does anybody have any questions for me? All right. We do have a need for an executive session this evening for potential litigation person to RCW 42.30.110, subsection one, subsection little i for an initial 15 minutes. Um, we will uh, be, uh, there will be action to follow, if nothing else, to adjourn the meeting. Um, I will announce any extensions that need to occur in this room. Uh, those announcements will be made in this room for anybody left attending and people not left attending. And then uh, will also be announced online uh, when the executive session and potential extensions are complete. Again, we will um, re, um, we'll come back into this meeting and then um, potential action, potential adjournment. So we are now on an executive session beginning at 8.04 for an initial 15 minutes.
The executive session has been extended 11 minutes. The executive session has been extended 10 minutes. The executive session has been extended five minutes. The executive session has been extended five minutes. The executive session has been extended an additional five minutes. The executive session has been extended five minutes. The executive session has been extended an additional five minutes. The executive session has been extended five minutes. The executive session has been extended 10 minutes. Out of executive session, we have no further business this evening. Unless there's an objection, we are adjourned. Seeing no objection, we are adjourned. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you.